67 years. That's for you. Anybody else been married to the same person? <laughs> for 60 years. 59. 58. 59 years? Mama, you did great. 59 years. And look at those children. Bless your heart, ma'am. Anybody that could be married for 59 years and put up with those children. There you go. Awesome. That is awesome. That, there's something to be said for that. To be married to that same person for that long. Because, you know, there was this time of first year of marriage that you were so excited. That, that you, you know, you, you're so excited and you get into that marriage and then you begin to learn about people. And for the first few years, you, you just wish you could eat them up. You know, you just, you're just learning more and you just wish you could eat them up. And, and then after five years, you wish you had. <laughs> you know? And, and, and you begin to learn more and... And, and and more and I was talking to Chris and, and, and Chris we were talking about it and on there how long y'all been married? Thirty four years. You notice I asked. Sorry. <laughs> and and Chris told me that on their twenty fifth anniversary they had this great shindig and, and everything and and he told me that he sort of got sentimental and he was out behind the house just a little crying and just little tears thinking about all this and Sue Lee came out and said oh honey why are you crying he said I was just thinking 25 years ago and she said oh that's so sweet what what were you thinking about he said well you know 25 years ago whenever your dad called us out behind the barn <laughs> and you know he, he said you can either get married or you can go to jail she says, yes, baby. He said, you know, I was thinking today I'd be getting out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, not her dad, it was her mom. <laughs> I, I pray that you have this great day of rekindling your love for each other. But... It, it shouldn't be just today. It should be every day. And if you know Christ as your Savior, there's a more passionate love. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you remember just briefly, last week we talked about how that the Philistines had, had taken the Ark of the Covenant and uh, through the things that God did to them, they sent it back to the Israelites. And it was housed, it was camped, it was kept at the home of Abinadab. And their son Eleazar was given the task of keeping the Ark of the Covenant, guarding it. Well, Eleazar, he passed away. And for 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant remained in the home of Abinadab. David becomes king. And David's desire is to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, to Jerusalem. And look with me in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel. 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty. We would say El Shaddai, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. Verse 3. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, thimbles, sistrums, and cymbals. 
When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and touched hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. Verse 9. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. For those of us that were raised in church, for those of us that have been Christians for any length of time, there, there is something fearful that takes place in our life if we're not careful. And that is we become comfortable with God. See, the Ark of the Covenant had been in the house of Abinadab for 20 years. And Ahio and his brother Uzzah had grown up around it. And whenever you grow up around the things of God, if you're not careful, they become so familiar that you're not challenged, you're not moved by the things of God anymore. Many of us, we grew up praying at meals. To pray at a meal is second nature. Many of us, we grew up praying before we went to bed. Say your prayers. To pray before bed, second nature. Some of us will grew up in church and, and we learned the books of the Bible. You know, we could repeat them. Some of us learn scripture, we can repeat the scripture. Some of us, we know the songs. I, I mean, I grew up, like I told you last Sunday, I, we were there every time the doors were open. I, 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 literally, I can sing most hymns without the words. But the problem becomes this. If we're not careful... It becomes repetition instead of worship. They begin to set the Ark of the Covenant up on the new cart. And they begin to take it towards Jerusalem on this oxen. Understand this is contrary to what God's Word says. The Word of God says it is to be carried by the priest. It is not to be set up on the Ark, on a, a, a cart to be taken. It's not to, even if it is a new cart. God said that it is to be carried by men who are set apart unto leading people to worship Him. And they are to carry it in front of the group as they go anywhere. If you and I are not careful, we become so comfortable with the things of God, and in the church especially, we become so comfortable that we begin to veer away from what God desires and we begin to do what we want to do. It would be easier to do this. It would be easier to do that. It's easier to build a cart a brand new cart, put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart, than it is to get men to carry it all the way from the house of Abinadab all the way into Jerusalem. Much easier. It's not always easy being a Christian, though. You can't always take the high road. Sometimes you have to go through the valleys. And what happened was, as they are heading towards Jerusalem, the oxen, God's Word doesn't tell us that they hit a hole or what happened, but the oxen stumble and the Ark of the Covenant begin to tilt and naturally, out of response to that, Uzzah says his hands up to stop the Ark of God from falling. And when he touched the Ark of God, God struck him dead. We would say how horrible. He is just trying to touch the Ark of God. He just, and we would make excuses for Uzzah. We do that. But the thing is, he did wrong according to the Word of God. He did wrong according to God's Word. And when you do wrong according to the commandments of God, there is no excuse. I, I know a guy in South Carolina was one of our deacons. And, and I love him and he's great. And he said, so many times he said, but, but Brother Stephen, I'm just human. We cannot use that excuse before God. Yes, we are just human. God knows that. That's why He gives us His Holy Spirit. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, then we could say, oh, we're just human. 
But God indwells us and He gives us this power to live a life that is sanctified unto Him. And whenever you and I don't do church, whenever we don't do life according to the Word of God, we cannot begin to please God. We cannot. I want you to look there as we have got the number two or the first one on your outline for today. I want you to know that you and I, we must love God, but we must have a fearful love of God. We love God. I grew up in a household that my dad loved us. I, I wish everybody had that type of household, but a lot of you didn't. My dad loved us so much and but the thing was, whenever Daddy cleared his throat at the supper table, we knew to straighten up. There was a fearful love of my dad. You know what I mean? You love him, but I'm not going to backtalk him. Why? He my daddy. And you don't backtalk daddy. I, I remember one time one of my sisters was teaching a backyard Bible club and the kids were messing around and everything. And, and it's funny how things stick in your mind. But I remember this one comment that my sister made to the kids that were playing around. She looked at him and she said, you need to be careful because you don't play with Jesus. And we have forgotten that. We have forgotten that we don't play with Jesus. God is to be loved. Yes, Jesus says so in Matthew chapter 22. When asked, what is the first and greatest commandment? Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Yes, love him. But be careful you don't get too familiar with God. Be careful. Because look there on your outline. The reason we ought to fearfully love God is because God is holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Peter writes, and remember, he's writing to the early Christians. And Peter says, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the Scripture says, You must be holy because I am holy. Literally, what the Greek says there is, you must be holy after the pattern of the one, capital O, who is holy. The Greek lays it out, you must be holy. Not that you and I can pick our holiness. Not you and I can choose how are we going to be holy. But it lays it out that I am to be holy after the pattern of Almighty God. Now we're going to say, oh, I'll never get there. I'll never get there. If you're a child of God, one day you will. But that should not cause us to cease striving to be holy. You know what holy is? It is to be sanctified. And we don't use that word a lot in churches anymore. We don't use the word sanctified because it's this long word. And people, we like to cut everything down and we like to do it, you know, just right. Well, listen to what sanctification means. To be sanctified means to be separated from the desires of this world unto the desires of God. It means that my whole life and everything that I do, I separate myself from the desires, the fleshly desires of this world, and I separate myself unto God because if I'm going to leave something, I've got to go to something else. If I'm going to leave the desires of the world, I've got to fill my life with something else or my life gets filled with so much more junk. Now, ladies, you've heard me say this many times, and Valentine's Day really brings this out. Ladies and men are so different. You know? Because you ladies, you ladies are spaghetti. Everything in your life just winds together. It, it, you know, if you were to talk to Tammy, she could tell you something, and it would just intersect with... Well, that's when Seth was so-and-so years of age, or, or Jennifer was so-and-so years of age, or that's when we went to such-and-such such a time. But that's what, you know, you ask me, I'm like, oh, we did that? But you ladies have everything connected. Emotionally, physically.
physically, mentally, everything is connected. All right, this next comment is PG-13. That's why your man can come home from work and go, Hey, baby, let's spend some time together. And you go, you don't know the day I've had. You do not know the day I've had. Right? And it has nothing to do with you spending time together. But everything is connected. Do you know this morning I got a phone call from so and so. And then what happened was the dog knocked over the trash. and got into the trash can. And did you know that this afternoon whenever I got ready to get ready for supper. The oven wouldn't work. And then now the guys. Us guys we've got everything in little compartments. Little boxes. And, and when we put something in a box, we can push that box away and not worry about it. That's why you can look at a man and say, what are you thinking about? Nothing. And he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. He's in his nothing box. He pulled that little box out, got in the nothing box, and you don't understand it because you're spaghetti. And that's why he could have had the worst day at work. And on the way home, he puts the work box back into its slot. And he pulls out that, hey baby. That box. And he walks in the door. And he is, hey baby. And you're, hey, yeah, you don't know. I don't know. It's true, isn't it? It's true. But here's the scary thing. Here's the scary thing, because we as men, if we're not careful, we want to put the things of God in a box by itself and close the box and open it only when we need it. You see, God is not just to be closed into one box. God is to permeate all of life. And my relationship with God is so much bigger than what can be contained in a box. We say, well, I'll give a piece of my heart to my wife and I'll give a piece of my heart to my kids and to my grandkids and I'll give a piece of my heart to Christ. No, if you give all of it to Christ, He'll make you love your wife and your children and your grandkids so much stronger and so much better because you give it all to Him first and He takes care of the details. To be sanctified means your desires of this world are are given away. Now it doesn't mean you don't get anything. It doesn't mean you can't like a good piece of pecan pie with ice cream on it or red velvet cake or or homemade apple pie. It doesn't mean that. What it means is my cravings for God are greater than the cravings for this world. And can I tell you something? This past week, Sharon Moriarty, her husband Jerry, went home to be with the Lord. And as I was talking to him a week prior, Jerry had come to the place in his life, you know, physically, he had been hurting for years, and he was just tired of it. And his desires to go to be with God was much stronger than his desire to be here. See, there's something that takes on in your life of the desire to God. As you become holy and you become holier and you become more closer to the Lord, there's something that takes over that the things of this world, they don't have that great. They don't have that on you like they used to. And it's called being sanctified. It's something that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. We can't do it on our own. It's whenever you give more and more release into the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit takes your life, and it begins working in your life, and it gives you more and more of a desire for God, and it gives more and more of a desire of what God wants in your life. Years ago, I went to a Billy Graham uh, evangelistic camp conference. And in, in the conference, <coughs> there were over 800 of us there from, from 80 different countries. And I was there, and, and i got to be honest, I grew up Baptist. 
You know, I, I grew up conservative Baptist. I grew up very strict, conservative, straight-laced Baptist. In other words, whenever I was in that praise service years ago at the Billy Graham conference, I didn't know what to do with my hands. And, and there, were, there were people from all over the world raising their hands and praising God. And I was going... Of course, Baptist, you don't raise your hands. You know, you know and you don't sway. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you're careful, you might get away with picking up one foot and putting it down. But you definitely don't move two feet. Because that's dancing. And we as Baptists don't dance. Yeah, you know, I didn't play pool until I was 18 years of age. I never went to a movie until... <clears throat> Well, I won't tell you who led me in the sin on that one. <laughs> I mean, we were strict. Very strict. Do you know that the closer you come to God, you don't care who's around you when you're worshiping? So, sometimes I raise my hand. Sometimes I'm so overwhelmed I just have to, you know? Because you forget. I, I, you don't care who's looking at you. They can watch you or what. It doesn't matter. Because you're so desiring to be in the presence of the Lord your God. And it doesn't matter. And the songs you sing, they resonate with your life. Redeemer. My healer. Lord Almighty. You, you know? And, and then all of us, oh, put that hand down. Uh, all of a sudden, it's like, whoa! This is who God is to me. Not just to everybody else, and not to my daddy, not to my mama, not to my grandparents. This is who God is in my life. And, and it's part of that sanctification that God says, no, you draw close to me. And Stephen, I'll draw close to you. See, Uzzah forgot that. He forgot that. He was into, let's, let's do our task before God. Let's light the fires of devotion. Let's, let's take care of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what God says? God says this. Draw near to me. Draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. Wash your hands, O sinners. Cleanse your heart. Draw near. What shall I bring before the Lord to please Him? Shall I bring a thousand rams to be sacrificed? Shall I bring rivers of oil to pour before Him? No, O man. You know what the Lord desires. The Lord desires to walk justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The greatest thing God desires is not all this other stuff that we do. And, and, and praise God for some of you that decorate and praise God Man, I walked in rose petals. Woo! You know? Right? I forgot we had a white pastor here. I, I thought we were I thought we were getting into it today. It's gonna be great. You know what? Because let me tell you something. Uh, the black churches I've been in know how to worship. I thought here well, we gonna have a good Sunday this morning. Here's the deal that we ought to all forget about everything else. And it's about walking humbly with God. And to do that is to be sanctified, to be moved closer to God. Sanctification is the act or is the process of acquiring sanctity. To sanctify is to literally set apart for a particular use in a special purpose or work and to make holy or sacred. 
did you know? Have you ever thought about this? If you are a child of the King, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, your life is to be sacred. Think about that just a moment. The life you live is to be sacred unto God. It is. That's why the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. To, to purge ourselves of sin so that we become more like Jesus Christ. You know when you first get married? I mean, some of you, Brother Wayne, Miss Shirley, have been married, whoa, close to 70 years. You know? Some of us haven't lived that long. Some of us at 39 can't remember 20 years ago. But when you first meet that girl, and she's just, oh, And, and your heart skips a beat. And you look at her and, and, and you just... Oh. You remember that? Guys, do you remember whenever you used to go to pick her up? And she used to say, I'll be ready in a few more minutes. And you said, oh, take your time. Right? Take your time, honey. I'll, I'll wait. Now on Sunday morning, you're blowing the horn on the car. Come on! Get outside! But I'm trying to get the babies ready. Well, hurry up. You should have started earlier. Whoa. Anyway. Remember those days, though? All you could think of was her. Now it's that new bass boat. All you could think of was her. You couldn't wait to talk to her. You got on the telephone and you called her last thing at night. And you went through all the mushy mush for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And finally it got down to saying good night. And you say, okay, I love you. She says, I love you. You hang up. No, you hang up. You hang up. No, you hang up. You No, you hang up. Right? Now you've been married 15 years and it's, all right, see you later. Click. <clears throat> it's done. Now think back to the first time you met Jesus. The first time you met Jesus. Do you remember how you felt? Do you remember how all things became new? Do you remember how it was like, whoa, this great burden is lifted off of me. Like, you could literally sense that the oppression of sin was gone from your life. And you were just, whoo, I'm, wow. And you told others. I mean, just like whenever you first fell in love with that girl, you had to tell everybody, right? And, and, and you went around in those days with pictures in your billfold. Now it's, look, 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 look. And all the guys would go, how did you get her? And, and, and most of us guys, all of us guys, we married above our station in life. Our wives took pity on us. And it's the same way with Christ. Out of His great love for us, we came to know Him. And we fell in love with Him because He first loved us. But here's the problem. Just like the wives in our marriages, same thing is true within our Christian life. It can get cold. You have to work at your marriage. You have to work at your marriage to keep it going. If you don't, things begin to get cold. You have to work at your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't, things get cold. And we soon forget. 
If you are not careful, we soon forget what it meant to be in love. I've heard so many people say, well, I love him, but I'm not in love with him. Oh, get over it. You know? The same thing is true about Christ. A lot of people, we fall in love with Christ, but then if we're not careful, we soon get over it. And we've got to go back to that beginning point. We've got to go back to the realization of who God is and, and that God is holy. But not only should we fearfully love Him because He first loved us and because He calls us to be holy, but we should fearfully love Him because our God, my God, is a consuming fire. You see, my God is... I cannot explain who He is. Go back and read, and I told you last week, go back and read Ezekiel chapter 6. I mean, excuse me. Isaiah chapter 6 or Ezekiel chapter 1. And especially Ezekiel chapter 1 because it talks about the radiance of God. Our God is a consuming fire and everything that is unpure, everything that is sinful, it is consumed in Him. It's done away with. That's why natural man cannot stand in the presence of God. We would be consumed. One day, and Peter talks about this, one day this world will be consumed by fire. Purity just mm, done away with. We have made such a wretchedness of what God created to be so beautiful and pure and holy that God will destroy it by fire. But our God is consuming fire. Look, in Hebrews chapter 12, since we, and put your name there, since Stephen is receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let Stephen be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe for our God, my God, your God is a consuming fire. There is a point in our life that you and I have to understand the holiness of God and not only that God is holy, but our God is powerful and His holiness, the holiness of God, is a consuming fire. My sin will not allow me in the presence of Almighty God. It will not. And every time I sin before God, it begins to break the communion that I have with Him. And every time I willfully and I with gusto sin and and understand that we willfully sin so often we desire the things of this world we do we desire the things of this world the lust of the flesh the pride of life the 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 desires the lust of the eyes and every time we go towards those things instead of retreating unto the love and the holiness of God. We sin before Him and that sin cannot, will not stand in His presence. We cannot worship God acceptably unless and until we worship Him with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 10.31 on the outline says this. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Like I said before, my dad was a loving man. Great father, godly man. He loved us very much. Nothing for my dad, and, and I'm so glad that God blessed me with the privilege of this. Nothing for my dad to come and hug us. We didn't have much. You know, like a lot of you, we, we, we hung blankets over the windows in the wintertime and over the doorways to keep the air from coming in. We did that. I mean, just like you, we did that. Uh, we, I remember opening the cabinet doors, and you could see outside because the hole in the wall. I mean, you know, you know how that is. 
But man, we had love. We had love. But there was a time in that that dad would clear his throat or he would call us by our first and middle names. And you understood you don't go any further. You don't, you don't go any further. My best friend in high school, Doug McNeil, Doug and I were out on a date one Saturday night, double date. And on Saturday night, our thing was, Dad had, you had to be in by 10 o'clock because you get ready for Sunday morning for church. I, there was never a question you'd be in by 10 o'clock. So Doug and I were out on a date 10 o'clock came. It left. 11 o'clock came. It went. And we come rolling back into the house a little bit after midnight. Like I said, my dad's a loving man, but come rolling back into the driveway of the house a little past midnight and praise God hallelujah it was dark praise God hallelujah there was no light on in the whole house so we I got out of the car closed the door real quiet Doug did not crank his car because this was back in the <clears throat> something years. Whenever you had the headers and the loud cams and the, you know, and when you go downtown, you want to see the windows rattle. Y'all remember, remember that, Chris? Oh, yeah, man. So I push him out of the driveway, right? You don't want to wait. Dad, I mean, come on. So I go to the back door. I take my shoes off. I go in the back door, turn around and lock it, and I go tiptoeing with my shoes left by the back door through the kitchen. Halfway through the kitchen, I hear, Stephen. Can I tell you, it might as well have been the voice of God. <laughs> At that moment, it might as well. I probably would have been more favorable if it had have been the voice of God. Stephen. Sitting in the dark is my dad. Yes, sir. Do you know what time it is? Yes, sir. And my dad knew how to get it. Because his next words were, we'll talk about this tomorrow. That's worse. That is so much worse. I mean, just go ahead and beat me, Daddy. Ground me. Do whatever you need to do, but do it now. Don't make me sleep through the night. Right? Oh, we'll discuss this tomorrow. Get to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. God does that with us. God does not strike us dead immediately now. I'm sure there are some times that God has. I'm sure there are some times that God is just... But you know what God does according to Romans chapter 2? God allows us this time. And, and Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, verse 2 or verse 3, and, and he says, do not be ignorant about this. Don't think that the long-suffering of God means that He's okay in my sin." Don't, just because God doesn't strike you dead today, don't think God's saying it's okay that you're sinning. Paul says what he is doing is that he is giving you time to repent and to turn back to him. See, that's how much love he has. God has so much love that he wants us to come back to him. But there's a problem. The problem is this, if we keep sinning without confessing, without turning back to Him, 
There comes a point in a time that God says enough is enough. I believe that so much. I've seen it so many times in the years of ministry. Whenever people were saying one thing, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and they were living one different life than following Christ. And I've seen time and time again where God would speak to them and they would get back out and do the very same thing and God say, okay, that's enough. See, you don't play with Jesus. You don't play with God. The only way to worship Him is through reverence and with awe. Because our God is a consuming fire. And there may be something in your life today that you have to go, God, this is Valentine's Day. And, and, and I, I just want to tell you, I love you. I know that you love me. But Father, you know, I've been stretching that point for a while, God. I've been stretching that point that I know is wrong, that I know, God, you're not pleased with my life. I know I'm a child of yours. I know I'm a child of yours. You ever been there? And God says, the only reason I've let you get by so long is because I wanted you to turn to me in repentance. See, 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the key is that we confess, then He forgives. Read Romans chapter 2 because there's a time that God says enough is enough. Our God is holy and He calls us to be holy. Our God is a consuming fire that destroys our sins and devours the sins of mankind. And God calls us to respect Him. And just like uh, Uzzah, there comes a point that God says, okay, enough's enough. You don't go past the where you play with the things of God and you don't get chastised for it. God wants you and I to live holy lives. God wants us to live sanctified lives. And the only way of doing that is departing where we have been living in sin and going back to Him. You will not find holiness in the things of this world. You will not find sanctification in the things of this world. You will only find it in God. Only in God. Draw near to God. He will draw near to God. Cleanse your heart. Wash your hands. And return to Him. Let's pray. Valentine's Day is a great day to be reminded of those that we love. And again, that should be something that we are doing every day of the year. Reminding those that God has blessed us with how much we love them. But especially to be reminded of the love of God. God's love is powerful. It's the greatest force on this earth. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. But as great as his love, so is his wrath. You don't play with God. And, and it's time that we as church, it's time that we as Christians quit playing church. It's time that we quit playing as Christians and that we begin to really worship and we begin to follow him in our hearts and our lives. And maybe this morning you're to that point that you're stretching, you're stretching the long suffering of God. You're, you're stretching his patience. And you know he's called your name on it. You know he said something to you about it, but you keep stretching it. And right where you're seated, you say, God, Father, I, I, I know you've called my name. I know that you've spoken to me about this issue, God, that does not bring glory to you. And, and today, I confess it unto you that you are right. I am wrong. And according to your word, I confess it. I, I throw it at your feet. And according to your word, I seek your forgiveness. Father, forgive me. And I come running back to you, Lord. Not with thousands of rams or not with thousands of gallons of oil but with myself. Take me. Sanctify me in your spirit. 
Draw me unto you, O God. I want to be back close to you. I want to sense your presence with you. To know you. To love you. Oh God. Take this offering. Use it for the kingdom, O oh Lord that many might come to know Christ. In His precious name, O Lord. Amen.